Talk about life and what you're preaching. Family tales and where you're going. Truths you need without the sugar coating. What is going on, everybody? How's everybody doing? It's another day, another dollar, another 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 episode of emails. What's it coming down to? Got some emails, got some stuff going on. Just so you guys know, um, I'm going to get share a little bit of news, but also before I share that news, I want to just make sure everybody knows. I don't care where how you how you vote, just go vote. Okay, I know. Literally tomorrow is uh, election day, and if you haven't done it already, go vote. Um, because it's your civic duty. Now, I do have my personal feelings when it comes to that. My personal feelings are: I believe in freedom, and I believe that we should be free, and we should do the things that be able to do what we want to do without having to have our um, squirrels and our uh, raccoons killed. I'm mean, okay. So let me touch on that for a second. You know, I, I, so here's the thing. I am no person for that wants to harbor fear, wants to tell people to be afraid of things. I don't want people to be, you know, live their life in total fear. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, but I do say this. If you have a government that can, that can come into your home, take your animals away, and I know your, people are going to say, well, he didn't have a permit. Fine. But here's the question. If a government will come into your home, take a raccoon and a squirrel that you have raised up and you raised those up from the baby because they were they were they were abandoned and you you brought them back to health you made them all nice and good you you basically made them a better a better animal and the government comes in and takes them away from you and then they murder that animal because that, that that this did happen they did kill the animal right um if you have a government that'll do that then you have a government that'll do other things for you right or to you and especially if you have a government that won't take care of, uh, you know, say we have a, a, you know, I know. So I have a friend of mine that she was in um, Chicago and she was with her kids and she was waiting for the American Girl doll um, store to open up. We had it within five, 10 minutes or whatever, just waiting outside. And the thing is, this, you know, she's just waiting there and this guy's walking down the street. He walks right up to her and she gets in front of her kids because like a good parent would like, so she is a good parent. Walks up to her and he punches her right in the face. He continues on. She's hurt. She's got a huge black eye, by the way. Um, shocked. She's she can defend herself, but she she did the right thing and protected her kids. 
calls the cops. American Girl Dollar Police open up. They're all nice and everything like that. The cops show up. When they show up, they tell her, you know, you can file a report. You can do all this other stuff. I mean, I'm gonna tell you, you can go find her on Instagram. She talks about it, not Instagram, but uh, um, TikTok. But and she and essentially, the cops say, file a report. We can take him to jail. That's not gonna do a dang thing. He's gonna be out in just a couple hours because they don't prosecute this stuff. Now, this is in Chicago. I get it. It's Chicago. Chicago is, a, is kind of a a crappy place to be. I like the town. I've been there many times, but it's dangerous. Now, on the other side, when you have a when you have your government that won't take care of you, when there's something like that. When there's people who have literally mental issues like that going on, you you, you got you got to take care of them. You got to do the right thing. Now, that being said, but it's dangerous. You know, you you, you have to um, you have to sit back and you have to make sure that you're you you have to make sure you you got to take care of your citizens. You know, bottom line, you take care of your citizens no matter what. I mean, your citizens mean more than anything else. Your citizens are the ones that that are the ones that matter the most. Um, and then you know, when you have, and I'm, I'm not against you. I'm I, get, come here to our country. Don't get me wrong. I want people to come to our country. I'm a believer in, in, you know, immigration, but immigration in the right way. So here's the thing. Go vote, go vote. Seriously. Um, now I will touch on one other thing and I keep seeing this all over X. I see it on Instagram, see it everywhere. And I'm and this, I guess I can get away with talking politics right now, whether it makes you mad or not. I want to touch on something that people really don't want to hear. Seriously. And when I say um, people yeah, we'll touch on- don't want to hear it, I'm going to say it in this way. When it comes to abortion, this is, this is going to be a very touchy subject because here I am. First of all, you, people have said it before. You're just a white dude that has no right to talk about this. Here's the deal. If you don't like what we have going on in our country when it comes to abortion, it's not the president who's going to change the, change the minds of, of the law. It's not going to be Congress that changes the law. If you understand how the law works, you understand that the Supreme Court made a judgment. And they said, we're not doing this. We throw it back to the states. So if you don't like what your state does, because it's not a federal law, the, the Supreme Court says, we're not touching it. It's not us. Take it to your state and vote it on in your state. Get your uh, get, get it's a it's a state issue. It is not a federal issue. If you voted or you're going to vote tomorrow, and you voted because or you're going to vote tomorrow because you believe that there's a, that uh, Kamala is going to give you the right to an abortion, you're lying to yourself because she, you you have become a pawn in in the, that that type of person's hands, and you know you you're you're literally a puppet and they've got the strings and they they're pulling those strings and telling you what you want to hear but the reality is that has nothing to do with it okay and i'm sorry to say it this way but that's how it is and i know and you're going well you're just an, again you're just a white dude that should not have an opinion on this well my opinion is this if you don't like the law change the law but you'll never get it done federally because it's impossible to get done federally because the supreme court says we're not touching it and that means no one else can touch it except your state Make your state do their job. If you don't like it, change it. If you do like it, keep it. That's the reality. Now, I have my own personal feelings when it comes to this. and I, But you know what? I'm going to leave it at that. That's what it comes down to. Plain and simple. So, uh, anyway. Now that that's all said and done, let me get to some of the good stuff. Okay? We got some good stuff. We got some good emails coming up. But I'm going to say, so I've got um, here in the next uh few days to a week, maybe two weeks. I've got a project that I've been working on. Um, This project is kind of big. Actually, it's really big. I'm not going to say what the project is quite yet. But I'm going to ask a huge question. You don't have to like me. You don't have to like anything else. But please do me a favor. And when it comes to this project that I'm going to talk about, do me a favor, take the project that I have that's coming. It's a big, big project. It's a nice, big filming project coming up, okay? So that being said, when I roll out with this project, I'm not asking you for, to help me out. I'm not asking you to pay, me, pay any money. Only, well, I am asking you to help me out. I'm not, I'm not asking for any money. If you want to contribute to the funding of this, that'd be awesome. All I'm asking for right now is to share the project with everybody. 
because the more people that see the project, the high, the likely higher likelihood that we have it to, to, to actually happen. So I've got a lot of money invested in myself. Um, I'm kind of crowdfunding a good bit of money for the project as well. And then I have some money coming in from sponsors and, and other things. So that's coming over here. And then I also have sent this project over, which it's, I was asked to send it over to him and I did. So I, I, I sent the project over to Amazon. I sent it over to um, Netflix, Hulu, um, National Geographic, Disney, um, even HBO. So every, literally everybody's got this, this, I, this project that, that, that I've been, been working on. And I've been working on this for a little bit, right? Um, not going to say what it is quite yet. I don't want to, I don't want to say anything until I have it ready to roll out. All I'm asking for right now and all I'm, all I need right now. And then, then that, this is the, the plain and simple part. All I'm needing right now is people to commit to say, yes, I will share this. Just share it. Okay. If you want to commit some cash to it and help me get the, get the funding to get it go completely, that would be a beautiful thing. Okay. But I'm not asking you to give me money. If you believe in the project and you want to help out, that is awesome. I will totally take it. My wife will take it. We would appreciate it very much because this, this is kind of a big undertaking. It's going to be a project that's going to take about a year, about a, maybe even a little bit over a year of filming to do all this. So that being said, if you want to help, please do. Seriously, I would appreciate it. Anyway, um, you guys didn't come here to talk about my stuff. You came here to talk about some some questions, some uh, some emails that I got, some stuff that people have some problems and things that people want to know. You came for all of that. You came to hear the ups and downs of people, and you came to get some advice. So there's that. So those of you guys that are watching next, so just, just so everybody knows if you're watching on Instagram, I'm slowly getting out of the lives on Instagram because... Instagram has not liked me for a while. And part of the reason they haven't liked me is because I'm doing this um, and they'd want me to not do this. They want me to conform to a different type of content where that's not the other type of content. I like doing some of it, but I don't like to have to come up with ideas to uh, do skits and things like that all the time. gets old. And honestly, it's not what I'm, I'm built to do. I'm built to give advice and that's what I'm doing. So, I'll be slowly moving everything over to X because honestly, I can keep being monetized on on X. So if you guys want to follow me on X, it's under my name, Devin Youngblood. Find me over there. Um, the podcast is still going to be same. It's all going to be same type of content. I'll keep keep answering questions. People can keep emailing me questions. People can, people can be, keep uh, text messaging me questions. They can even call in, leave a message. Doesn't matter. It's all good. I will answer any question there is. It doesn't matter what it is. doesn't matter how taboo it is. And that's what Instagram doesn't like. They want me to fall into a certain mold. And that's how they've they've um, kind of just kind of de demonetized me over there, which has been a rough thing, especially when that's been a good portion of my income. So thank you guys for supporting me. That's all I'm going to say. But if you want to support me more, go over to X and follow me over on on there. I know that's the what some people consider the evil uh, Elon Musk uh, platform, but at least we have freedom of speech, and that, that's one thing I'm gonna give you. And if they, if I say anything wrong, I do get fact checked, and that that simple as that too. So no big deal. So anyway, let's get to some of these emails. I got one. This one here actually is from Salt Lake City, Utah. So it's right here in my back door. So anyway, it says, "Hey Devin, I hope you're doing well. I am doing very very well. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm Alex from Salt Lake City." And I've been struggling with anxiety lately, particularly as the political landscapes become more polarizing and divisive, especially with the ongoing discussions surrounding Trump. I get it. We are in the politics season. Literally tomorrow is, is uh, in some, some, may, some may say judgment day. I don't know. <laughs> but so then it says, um, I find myself consistently worrying about the future and how political divisive how political decisions will impact my family and community. It's hard to escape the barrage of, of news and opinions that often feel overwhelming. How do I manage this, this anxiety and keep informed without becoming consumed by it? What, str what, what strategies can I use to foster a sense of hope and stability during these uncertain times? Your insights would be greatly appreciated. So here's the thing. I get it. People don't like Trump. 
people don't like Harris. Okay, I understand. I know that if you're watching the news, you have well, you have media in general. They'll go one way or the other. If it's Fox News, they go one other, one way. If they're CNN, they go another direction. If it's online, if it's all, it's all polarizing. It, it, and honestly, it, it gets it's getting very old. Thank goodness it ends tomorrow, right now. The thing is, you got to do is not honestly. You can't worry about it too much, right? You want to protect your family, and then I understand, Alex, that you, you that you 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 feel like there's going to be your future. The future is is uh, kind of unknown at this point. So here here's the thing. I've heard everything a person could ever say bad about Trump. I've heard everything that a person could ever say bad about Harris. And I'm going to say it this way. I believe that after seeing four years of, of now I'm going to say it now, this is this hear me out people. Okay. Listen to me. I've seen four years of Trump. Okay. It wasn't that bad. He hurt some people's feelings. I get it. Okay. We have kind of seen four years of Harris as well. I mean, so if I am to believe what she says, and she says that she that she, her word her words were I would ne- I would not have changed anything that Biden has done. Okay, and she stands behind that. So if that's the case, my my opinion is this: what we need to do we need to pray for our leaders, plain and simple. I don't know if you're a praying person. If you're in Salt Lake, you probably are. Most likely, well, okay, Salt Lake has two two divisions, right? You either are part of it or you're not part of it. But my opinion is pray for our leaders. If Harris becomes our new president, pray for Harris. Pray that she'll be a great leader. Pray that she'll do the right things that will bring our country uh, to a good head that will actually continue in, in a good path. That's what we got to pray for. Now, if Trump is elected, and even if you don't like uh, Trump, you should be doing the same thing. You should be praying that Trump will do the same thing for us. Okay, I am a conservative, but I'm going to tell you, was Obama my president? Yes. Was um, Biden my president? Yes. Do I like everything they have done? No. Has my my bank account been affected off of different presidents throughout um, history? Absolutely. So what do we do? I can tell you. We pray that they'll do the right thing and we'll hope that they will. Now I know I'm asking people to pray. And if you're not a praying person, that's fine. Okay. Throw it out to the universe. That's what you do. Throw it up to the universe. Say, Hey, do this for us. Help us get it done. Right. So we all will be affected in a good way. I get it. It's hard. It's frustrating. It is not fun, but it's part of it, okay? It'll be fine. I promise you. The strategies you need to do, spend time with your family. Do the things that... Some things are never going to change, okay? Honestly, some things will change. Now, to what extent, we don't know. We've heard every horror story that could ever come to play it's out there. People are going to always going to say it. They're always going to say, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And they're going to talk about it in those ways. And you know, it it is what it is. There's not much we can do about it. Right. Only thing we can do is again, pray and hope that it works out for the rest. Simple as that. I honestly, if Harris becomes our next president, I hope she does a dang good job. I, I do. I will say it. I went there. I hope she does. If Trump does uh, becomes our next president, I hope he does a dang good job. Okay, it's that simple. I, I'm not going to say to tell you that you sh- what you sh- who you should vote for. I'm just going to tell you go vote, vote for what you feel is the best thing in the world to do, and it will and it's the right thing. But don't stress about the future. Take care of your family. Be happy, and it will be okay. Plain and simple. Seriously, plain and simple. That's what you got to do. Honestly, I mean, you, yeah. don't stress too much. 
Don't stress too much. It's okay. Seriously. Simple as that. Anyway, let's go to the next one. Hey, Devin. I hope you're doing well. Everybody wants me to do well. That's awesome. Everybody wants me to do well. Um, I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I'm at my significant crossroads in my life. Recently, I received I received a job op, job offer that could require me to move to Seattle, leaving my close knit uh, family and friends behind. The winter fast with winter fast approaching, the thought of leaving my support system during such a cold season is daunting. How do I make it make this decision without letting fear dictate my future? What factors should I consider when weighing the potential risk and rewards? Okay, so, you know, when it comes to business, when it comes to your job, if you've been offered a good job and your job is going to make, is, 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 it get, can put you in a better spot for your life so then you know what you're going to do, where you can make enough money to you can provide your family and then some, but yet you have to move away and get away from your friends. I mean, change can be good, okay? Don't get me wrong. Change can be good. Um, Honestly, I would take it. I mean, the risk versus reward is simple. One, go. honestly, you have to go at it in a methodical way, and you have to say, okay, am I going to be making more money? The job, is it going to be help me grow and do better? Are these, you know, the, the, you, kept, you need to do a pros and cons. That's what this is, needs to do. You know, the thing is, if it can bring you better job security, and I can tell you in the past few, past several years, it's been harder and harder to make money. And it's been, you know, it's one of those things that, that it, when we do make money, it seems like it goes out just as quick as it comes back in. If you're having the ability to make more money, but yet you have to be away from your family, you know, I have to say, if you can set yourself up better for the future, you should do it. Now, on the other side, if you are the only means to, to for uh, people to get around or you know or to take care of your family, if you're that only means, that's going to be the hard part. It may be, come to a point where you may have to move your family with you. Now, I get that sometimes families don't move with you, okay? But you gotta you gotta think about this. The risk versus reward when it comes to moving to another area, you know, sure you don't know those people. You don't. You're just not. You're not around the people that you. Your your new your old, your friend group. But you can get new friends, and you know, not that I'm saying replace your friends. You can get more friends. Just adding more people to the mix. Things that can help you make you make you better. Right. Don't stress over that. It's going to be fine. What you need to do is focus on. On what will make you better and follow through with that. Plain and simple. If this is something that can make you a better person and can bring better information to your to your light, do it. You know, I know I get fear jumps in all the time when it comes to moving to new places, but don't let fear fear dictate what you're gonna do. Fear is just fear. Fear is always going to be there. And honestly, fear of the unknown is always going to be there. You just have to know if you take that first step, that's all you need to do. When you're in the dark and you're trying to find your, your way around, take a step forward. Then take another step forward. It just takes those simple little steps. You, you, it'll be okay. You know, if you do that, you're going to be fine. Everything, and, and honestly, it may be hard, but it will work out. Again, it, it's it's a um, you know your path is not always set. You know, some people think, well, destiny's to this. Your path is not always set. Anyone that says your path is set, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, it, 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 the th- the simple things in life are just making sure you're doing what is best for you. Doing you know, making sure you're you're not hurting anyone else. And honestly, it will all work out after that. It's that simple. So, anyway. Hey, Devin. Hope this me- message finds you well. It does. Thank you very much. You know, I love the. I've been getting new emails, and I've been, I've been putting new stuff out there, so it's good. Um, I'm Lisa from Portland, Oregon. 
ah, someone's about to move it to you probably. And I'm struggling with my 16-year-old son. Uh, he's been acting out and testing boundaries. And as winter approaches, it's getting winter everywhere. I know. These are new emails. I'm worrying about the influence of his peers with a, during the cold months when kids are often seek comfort in risky behaviors. I've tried to talk to him, but he shuts down and pushes me away. I'm terrified that if I push too hard, I'll drive him further away. How can I foster open communication and trust while still setting necessary boundaries? What should I do if I suspect he's involved in risky business, risky behaviors? Your guidance would be would mean the world to me. Okay, it really comes down to what you what you're saying is risky behaviors, okay? I mean, kids are always going to do dumb things. They're always going to, you know, I know when I was uh, 16 years old, um, 16, 16, yeah, I think I was 16 years old, 17 years, 16 or 17 years old. Um, probably was 17, actually. I, I did risky behaviors too. Now, there's this one night, and I'm, I'll get to your question. Let me just get to this. Though. But there's one night my, where I lived in, in my hometown. We lived on uh, this really steep hill. It was basically near, it's considered Clock Tower Hill. But it was on the road that crossed one of the main streets. It, so it was a really long uh, road. And it crossed, on, crossed Broad Street, went straight through, and it was super steep. Now, me as a teenager, I, I would rollerblade. I, me and my friends, we would roll, rollerblade pretty much all over the town. This was the 90s, okay? So get, get, we had pretty much free reign of the whole town, um, especially at 2 o'clock in the morning. Ain't nobody out at 2 o'clock in the morning um, except me, my friends, and apparently my dad because my dad's like, if you're going to do something stupid, I want to be there with you. So here's the thing. You want to be involved in your kid's life, right? So here's what my dad did. My mom was like, don't do this. Please don't do this. I'm like, no, nope, we're going to do it, but we're going to do it, and we'll be safe, and we'll be fine, and all this other stuff. So we're on this hill, and we had there's two traffic lights, one at the middle of the hill and one at the bottom of the hill. We started at the top. Now, what we did, we had one person at the bottom, one person in the middle. When it was clear, they told you to go. And the person at the very end of the street Obviously, it's a long hill, so you had he had to either stop traffic or he had to make or you had to just bail somehow and just go that route. Now, that being said, we're rollerblading and it was my turn to go. I'm I'm there. I'm I was like the, we're going to test it out. We had my friend test it out from the middle, and I said I'm going to do it from the top. So I started from the top. I got my feet going, and I'm going. I'm booking it. You know, actually back backtrack. Let's backtrack a little bit before we I did that. That after the test run was done, um, the cop looks at us and he says, hey, let's see if I can clock you coming down that thing. Well, he, he flags us over first and I'm like, oh, no, we're going to jail. And then he says, hey, let's see if I can clock you coming down that thing. We're like, okay, done. So we got to the top as fast as we could. I get going. I'm going. I am booking. My legs are wobbling like crazy. It's, it's, you know, getting the, the death wobble happen to your, to your feet when you're, run, when you're going down the a hill on rollerblades is insane. I'm going down. As, we go, as I go down, I cross the first road. Boom. I crumbed to the second road. Now, the problem with the second road, there was a little bit of dip. So when you hit that dip, you either jump or you wipe out. I'm booking it. I go down. I pass the cop, everything, and boom. It was awesome. There I was. I, did, I was doing 45. And, you know, he, cop flags me over again. He's like, I, I got to go clock out, but that was amazing. Don't ever do it again because it was illegal, honestly. And then uh, he says, by the way, you're doing 45 miles an hour. So I got clocked. <laughs> on rollerblades coming down the hill at 45 miles an hour. Stupid. I did stupid things. Now, for you, Mom, I can tell you this, okay? Your kids are going to do dumb stuff. Doing that kind of thing, sure, it can be bad, right? But if they're doing it safe, you got to let your kids live, live their life, right? Make sure they understand that you love them, for one. Make sure that they, they, they have to understand that you love them. As long as the, you have an open door uh, communication rule with your kids, they're going to be fine. Now, if you think they're getting in with the wrong crowd and that wrong crowd is there and they're, and they're forcing, pushing them to do things that are, you know, like, whether it's drugs or, or anything like that, then you step in. And I don't care what it takes I don't care how mad and pissed off he is. You lock that dang window in his room. You don't let him out. Nothing. You take Because here's the thing. If your kid's going to be involved with bad people, your job as a mom is to not let him be involved in bad people with bad people. Dead serious. You don't have to be the cool mom. You just got to be the mom. 
And I know that's hard, especially when they're a teenager and they want they want to buck the rules and they want to do do, the, do things that they want to do. You have to you have to instill in them that no matter what goes on in their life, the things they do do now can still affect their life in the future. It's super important to teach your kids to do the right things. Even if it means you intervene and you don't let them hang out with those friends. And I'm dead serious about that. And that, that means, um, even, even if it means reporting your kid to the police, for them to learn the lesson. If you know your kid's doing the wrong stuff, you don't let him do the wrong stuff. None of your kids. As long as they're in your house, it is your, this is your house. This is your rules. They can have freedoms, but those freedoms are contingent upon obedience to the house rules. In my house, we have simple rules. We go to church. We pray. You don't yell at me. You don't yell at your siblings. Plain and simple. And you sure as hell don't yell at my wife. Those are the reality. If my kids can live by that, it's fine. And my kids can listen. And my kids, I can talk to them. And we can discuss things. Anything and everything is under uh, open to a discussion. But if you're still a teenager, then you still need to live by my rules. You don't have to like it. But if you're, if I'm, if I'm still over you as an adult and you're not an adult, I'm responsible for you. That means I'm responsible for you, the bad things that you do. So that means you got to listen. Just do the right thing, mom. Okay. I'm telling you right now. It will be fine. Set some boundaries. As long as your kids know that you love them, as long as your kids know that they can come to you at any time and talk to you, it'll be okay. Allow your kids to make some mistakes. You can't hover over them all the time. Allow them to make some mistakes, but let them understand there is accountability and there is they have to be responsible for the th- actions that they do in their life. Accountability is the biggest thing that a parent can teach their child, plain and simple. And we live in a world that doesn't like accountability, and that's sucky, but it is what it is. We have to be accountable for the things that we do, and we have to be accountable for all our our actions and everything that we go through in our life. We have to. There is no other choice. Those are th- that's plain and simple. You, you got to do it that way. Okay. I know that's not fun. I know it's not what, what your kids want to hear. It never will be. But it doesn't matter what they want. What matters is that they know you love them and that you're going to be there for them and help them do the right thing. That's the bottom line when it comes to having kids. Love your kids. Even if they don't like the idea, even if they don't like the decisions that you make, even if they don't like the rules of your house, let them know that you love them and everything else will work out. Pretty simple. Hey, Devin. I hope you're doing well. I'm Rachel from Chicago. Hello, Rachel. And after... uh, After 10 years of marriage, I feel like my husband and I have fallen into a com- comfortable but a stagnant routine. While we love each other, the romance has faded, and I find myself yearning for the connection we once had. I've tried planning date nights, but nothing seems to reignite the spark. How do we navigate this phase in our relationship and rekindle the passion without forcing it? What steps should I take to create a deeper emotional bond? All right, Miss Rachel, here's the deal. You guys have been together for a while, 10 years. That's good. Congratulations. That is amazing. That is epic. Most people, a lot of people I know don't make it that far. So you are in a good spot. Now, the problem is you're having is you have, you guys have become stagnant in your situation. And part of that is, is effort on both sides. Okay. So you're saying no matter what you've tried, trying date nights, nothing seems to reignite the spark. 
are you going on the date nights? Okay, that's one, number one. If you're going to the date, on the date nights, you're doing something right. Now, I understand everybody wants their marriage to be just like it was when you first got married, right? Everybody wants to have that spark where everything's amazing, where you guys are doing all the cool things. You're, every, everything feels new. Everything feels fresh. That, that first kiss type you know, deal, every bit of that. Everybody wants that. Okay, cool. But that does go away. But it doesn't have to always be gone. You guys obviously love each other. 10 years. Again, congratulations. I say this, and I always say it jokingly, but I'm actually kind of serious. When it comes to relationships, when it comes to bedroom stuff, you women have to understand you're in charge. Okay. You are. You're 100% in charge. And there's nothing that anyone can say that can change my mind. Because I can tell you what. No man can force it. And if they do, that goes to, they go to jail. Two, if you, if you, if, okay. Being that you're in charge of bedroom stuff. If you're feeling your life is stagnant, I'm going to tell you something. No man that I know would ever turn down his wife if she started to initiate something. Now, that can be simple as a look. Sometimes we're dumb, okay? I get it. Sometimes, actually, a lot of times us men are dumb. Sometimes we just don't know what we're doing, and we're just kind of like a big O sitting there and not paying attention to the, to the, to the, uh, the, the subtle little hints that you ladies do. Now, be more than subtle. I'm dead serious. If you want to reignite that spark a little bit, let them go off to work one day. I really want someone to do this, okay? I don't know if anybody's ever seen the older movie. I guess it was 80s, 90s movie, something like that, called Fried Green Tomatoes. If you have, then you know where I'm going on this one. But I want someone to do this and then report back to me how it worked, okay? I promise you, if, you're, if your marriage is stagnant and you don't feel like that the spark is there, this will bring back the spark, okay? Plain and simple. I want you, when your husband goes off to work, straighten the house, make a great meal, make, do, do all the things that you know he would want to have, okay? Men are simple. Men just want to have something be respected. They want to have somebody to talk to. They want some action, and they want some food. That is literally the simple, how simple men really are, and I'm dead serious. Any man that tells you differently, they are liars. Plain and simple. So when he comes home from work and you know he's due to be home from work, the simple thing that I want you to do, and you're going to think I'm totally ridiculous, before he gets home, before he gets home, go to the kitchen, take out the dang saran wrap, that clear plastic wrap, wrap yourself up in into a plastic, you know, slinky dress, see-through dress. I am dead serious because two, you're going to get two types of reactions. The first one will be a laugh. The second one is, is, Oh man, she ain't got nothing on underneath that. Okay. So I'm serious on this. You have to believe me. If you're, if you're, if your marriage is stagnant by any means, if you did this and you greeted your, your husband at the front door, when he opens up that door and you're standing there looking like that, he's going to laugh and then he's going to react in kind like he's supposed to. And I promise you, the spark will just start again. Then things will happen. And then things will get a little bit normal. And then you do something else again the next day or maybe give it a day or the other, every other day. My wife and I, we have a rule. It's about it roughly about every other day for us. Okay, just so you not, not that you guys ask or anything, but that's one one watch one reason I don't partake in the the vain tradition of of people saying no nut November because it's a, yeah there's that. So, but that being said, if you did that, I promise you, you'll have that spark. It will come back. You there there will be nothing. There'll be nothing you can do to get keep him off of you. Okay. 
other than so if you want that spark back in your life do set some things that are honestly outside of the normal realm outside of the things that you don't want to do outside of things that would be considered weird i guess that's not weird i mean okay if you don't want to do the saran wrap i'm telling you okay you should try it but you should you, if you don't want to do it do something slinky do something that's here's the thing i think women have forgotten that men do love the idea of of lingerie. We do. We may not tell you, but we do. It's like seeing a woman in a bikini. We love seeing a woman in a bikini. Wear a bikini. Do something. I'm telling you, it will revive that spark. I'm telling you, you, you if you want a good emotional uh, bond with your spouse, you have to start with the basics. Simple as that. So, Rachel, I'm telling you, cook him a great meal. Start there. I'm I'm serious. And if you don't cook, learn to cook. And if you don't know, if you if you're worried about not knowing how to cook, take a cooking class with them. Do those things. Okay. Do reignite those that spark by doing the things that you know he likes. If he loves Star Wars, find some Star Wars event going on in your in your city and take him to the Star Wars event. I'm telling you, to find you know the things that you know he likes to do. If 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 my, if my wife and she does, if my wife goes in and she does anything about the things that I really enjoy doing, what happens is she she'll go she goes in and she'll she'll go in and if she she'll do the and it just makes me feel like she cares about me. If she spends a little bit of time doing something that I enjoy doing, although she may not like doing it, but just to do it with me, that means everything for me. That's amazing. So I'm telling you, if you want to reignite the spark, do the simple things that a guy likes. Do the simple things that guys care about. Talk to him. Be there for him. Don't don't you know, don't bug them and irritate them like oh you, you never talk to me. Just bring up things and and get interested in what he does. Two, cook him some food. Three, love him. I'm telling you. And four, just respect him. If you did that, I'm telling you, those things that you say that you uh, are that are have disappeared, they will come back. It'll be good. I promise you. All right. Hey, Devin. I hope you're having a great day. I'm Mark from Austin, Texas. And I'm feeling overwhelmed trying to balance out my career, family, my job as a marketing manager, and the demands and long hours that come with it. I worry that I'm missing out on important moments with my family during this coming season. Okay, got Christmas. I get it. My spouse is supportive, but I can sense the, the, the strain. I, I can sense the strain this is putting on our relationship. How do I prioritize my family while also striving for professional success? What steps can I take to create a fulfilling balance without feeling like I'm failing at either role? Okay, here's the thing. In reality, family comes first. You'll never here. The bottom line is this: when it comes to work, business, and when it comes to work, when it comes to all those things, you'll never regret missing out on a promotion. This true reality. You'll never regret, you know, not showing up for that, you know, that business dinner for you know that that work dinner, you know, that work party. You will regret missing out on your kids' first steps. You will regret missing out on, you know, taking that kid, your your child to the, the park and going down the slide with them. You will regret th not throwing that baseball with your son, not playing the tea party with your daughters. Those are the things you will regret. No matter how much you, no matter how much you realize, you think that your, your goal in life is to have this great, amazing career which you should have a good career. But no matter how far you go with a business, that's just work. That doesn't matter. 
Seriously. That's all that is. That's that's the things that that will they'll be there. No matter what, your work will always be there, and your work will always have more work for you to do. Wow, that's loud. Please, the, the, you know, the, your work will all, that work will always going to be there. You're when, no matter what you do when it comes to work, it's going to be there forever. It is never going to go away. It is going to be the thing that that honestly, work. I've seen work destroy uh, family. I've seen work take away the priorities of the average person when that when honestly they should just be spending time with their family. I've seen if you died today, your job's going to replace you tomorrow. They may made it. They may wait a day, but they're going to get that ad ready. HR is going to get that ad ready, and they're going to get that set up for you to go so they can replace you the next day. Plain and simple. Work's going to replace you. So the good the the good prioritize of life. Do what it's required for your job. Perform well, simple as that. Perform well. Get your duties done, but prioritize your family. Plain and simple. If you prioritize your family, your life will be the best life you'll ever have in your in the world. You'll have kids that love you, the kids that know that you're there for them. Kid, you'll have your wife back there behind you to push you along. Your wife will push you to work better and work harder. And that's the glory about having a great wife is you're going to, she'll be there to help you in the things that, uh, that matter the most. But in return, she will always remind you of what matters more than work. And that's going to be your family. So the best way I can tell you to prioritize your life is if you prioritize your family, your everything else will actually fall into place. Plain and simple. Anyway. Let's see what else we got. What else is in the mailbox for us today? Hi, Devin. Ooh, and hi, Devin. Instead of a hey, Devin. Hi, Devin. I hope, it, I hope you're having a great uh, evening, and I hope you get this email. I did. I'm Kevin from Raleigh, North Carolina. Ooh, a good old Southern person. I like it. I like my Southern people. I've I've been feeling uh, stuck in the rut, both personally and professionally. I've set some goals in the past, but uh, always seem to fail. Sh- fall, they always seem to fall short, and it's uh, left me feeling defeated. I'm questioning my career choices and and life decisions. How do I break free of this cycle of, and of self doubt and take actionable steps towards meaningful change? What strategies can I do? Can I use to identify what truly fulfills me and creates a plan for to pursue in the future? Okay, you know. Personal growth. Personal growth is is something that we all strive for. We all want to be the best we can ever be. We always want, always want to, all of us, every one of us, never want to fail at anything. Now, failure's good. Failure teaches us things. I say don't strive for failure. Strive for success, but embrace failure. That's the reality there. You have to strive for, for success, embrace failure, and learn from it to be successful in the future. Now, if you're feeling stuck in the rut, both personally and professionally, first you got to get figure. If you can't figure out your personal life, your professional life is going to suck. Your 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 personal life has to be in check, and it has to be there to make you uh, to for before your your professional life can even progress to even any further. So if you think that you can uh, you just get by by just doing the bare minimum, and say okay, I'm I'm a, I'm a wreck in my personal life, so work's gonna be fine. I'm gonna tell you it will eventually affect your business life. So one, let's affect let's let's talk about your personal life. Okay, how do you make your personal life good? Okay, one, what is going on? Why are you down? Why are things hard? What makes it hard? What is going on? Okay, if it's lack of money, then you need to work. Okay, simple as that. So yes, you have to, though that means you have to put up, put, honestly, sometimes you have to bottle things up and push it to the side. Now, if you're having a bad relationship, then you need to fix that. 
So if it means so if you're dating someone and they're bad for you, here's the thing. If you're in a toxic relationship, even if it's a marriage, whatever, it doesn't matter, get out of it. Okay. Yes, it will be hard. Yes, it'll be sucky. You know, I hear, well, I don't want to be alone. Well, you know what? You're not happy when you're with somebody. You need to be so you be you'll be actually happier without somebody. So whatever is going on in your personal life, you have to fix that first. And you need to talk to somebody about it, okay? If you're just tired a lot, you need to get some sleep. If you're not eating right, you need to eat right. Honestly, if you eat right and you sleep right and you exercise right, your personal life, for the most part, everything else will fall into place. If you're treating people with respect, that'll work. Now, let's move to your, your, your professional life. If you don't like what you're doing, find you a new job. Simple as that. Find yourself a new job. Do uh, Find something that you really enjoy doing. And if you don't have the experience to do what you want to do, go get the experience. If you need schooling for it, go to school for it. If you Take some online courses. Do something that's going to make your life that much better in the future. That's It's that simple. The, the, say how old you are. Let me look. Does not say how old you are. So here's the deal, Kevin. If you will work hard at everything that you do, and I believe, and you're saying that you set goals, so what you and you're, but you're falling short on those goals. Fine, okay. First thing about setting goals, a lot of times when we set goals, we set this big, great, giant goal, and we have this big idea of grandeur of this is how life is going to be because when I fulfill this goal, it's going to be awesome. But then all of a sudden, you fall short of of getting that big goal done. And because you fall short of getting that big goal done, then you're like, well, crap, I'm a loser now. Why are you setting such big goals? Okay. First of all, if you're going to set a goal and, and, and let's say you're not very good at fulfilling your goals. Okay. Set a micro goal, set a small goal, get to that small goal. First, start small, move to the next one. That's really what it comes down to. You have to set the small goals to, and achieve those before and, and see the feeling it is to, to achieve a small goal. So whether it's a work goal, whether it's a personal goal, doesn't matter what it is, set a small goal that is achievable, but that, but also does stretch you a little bit. Okay. Like if your goal, if if you set a goal, I'm going to make a million dollars. Well, that's a great goal, but how do you get to that million dollars? So you need to, you need to make, set a small goal. So, and to get to that next step. Okay. First thing to make to a million dollars, you need to make $1. Boom. Okay. Let's make the goal a little bit bigger than $1. Let's say, okay, I want to make a goal of $10,000 a month done. That is achievable. It going to require a lot of work and it may require a side hustle may require, you know, more hours at at your job, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay. Set set goals that will stretch you to a point that will make you become a better person. Achieve that micro goal, if you will. And then once you achieve that micro goal, then start setting average size goals because that you see now that you've seen that you can do it, go to the next one. If you're if you're want if you want personal growth, and you want to and you want to see, you know, it to, you want to see that it is actually progressing in the right way. Set attainable goals, but the attainable goals that will stretch you, and then do nothing but. Work your butt off to make that goal happen. Don't give up on it. Don't set it to the side. If it means you have to put off hanging out with friends to go finish your goal, don't fin- don't hang out with your friends. Push that off. Go finish your goal. That's what you got to do. Plain and simple. May not be what you want to do. But you set the goal, so then it's what you are obligated. You owe it to yourself to do it. You owe it to yourself to set those goals and to and work for those goals to make them happen. It's a promise that you've made to yourself. If you make promises to other people, then you and you follow through with those promises, then aren't you worth fulfilling your own promises? You have to fulfill your own goal promises to yourself and do the right thing for yourself and make sure it happens. Plain and simple. Hey, Devin. My family and I have, have, been, have been struggling with unhealthy eating habits. 
and a s- sedentary lifestyle. Okay, got it. Especially when with especially with winter approaching, we tend to get sick very easily. My husband works long hours. The kids often often resort to screen time instead of being active. I'm determined to make a change, but I fear that implementing new habits will uh, meet resistance and resentment. How can I create a family health plan that everyone can get aboard with with strategies? What, what strategies can I use to make this journey enjoyable rather than a chore? Okay. If you guys are sick a lot, especially since winter time's coming up, and you tend to just, everybody wants, it, okay, let's address the screen time, okay? Let's start off with there. If all your kids want to do is get on the phone or get on the iPads or computers or whatever, I get screen time is fun, but you need to start setting limits first, okay? To achieve to achieve what you want to do, you need to start setting the limits, Okay. One thing that people need, you guys need to do, one, you need to fix yourself mentally so you can fix yourself physically. Mentally, you got to get off the screens a little bit, push them to the side, sit back, read a book, go on a walk. And I get wintertime, it gets sucky like that because it's cold. I know like getting my wife out of the house during wintertime is next to impossible here in Salt Lake because it gets cold. It's already started getting cold. Um, we're probably, I think tonight we're supposed to be in the thirties. I don't think we're going to be freezing, but it's supposed to be in the thirties. But to get it, to make good, healthy habits, you got to start somewhere. And honestly, start with subtracting screen time Two, start with a simple walk. Um, I will tell you, look at the food you're eating, change that out. If you're eating the wrong stuff, change, get, start eating the right stuff. I'm dead serious. And don't tell me that you go off the food pyramid because that's once you realize that the food pyramid is the biggest joke in the world and one of the biggest far cities we've ever had in our society, then you'll be like, oh, wow. You know, the thing is to create good habits for a family, it, the, the kids typically follow what parents do. Okay. And if if you as a parent do the right thing, you and your husband do the right thing, your kids will follow along. The reality is it's your house. You set the limits, you set the rules, they will follow along. Sure, it'll be a chore sometimes. But thing is, when it comes to raising kids, you just gotta be meaner than your kids. <laughs> and I mean that in a nice way. When it comes to be raising kids, they're gonna push boundaries. And they're going to try to get everything that they want out of what you as fast as possible with the least amount of resistance. And when you give in to them, then they know that they can push you in a certain way and they're going to win. But if you can, if you can help, if you can just be strong and you can avoid that, then you will win. You'll be in charge of it all. Cause I mean, you're the parent, you should be in charge anyway. So there's that. So that being said, Stick to your guns, tell your kids what's up, do it, do it right, and it'll be okay. Hey, Devin, this is Sarah from Boston. Hello, Sarah from Boston. I'm reaching out because I'm struggling with my relationship with my in laws, they have strong opinions about how my spouse and I should manage our lives. From parenting decisions to career choices, I want to maintain a good relationship with them, but I also feel like my uh, boundaries are consistently being tested. My spouse is caught in the middle, and I don't want this to create tension between us. How can I navigate this delicate situation while preserving my relationship with my in-laws and keeping the peace in my marriage. Okay. First of all, you got kids. 
you've been dealing with in-laws for a while and now you're coming to me asking me for advice because your your husband feels caught in the, mid, in the middle. So I'm going to say it this way. You got to make some waves. Plain and simple. You got to make some waves. And I mean that. Seriously. If you're a uh, in-laws, what do you... <laughs> I don't know if you guys hear that. Bentley's behind me, and he's uh, being very mouthy right now. <laughs> it, you you, you got to set boundaries. Your in-laws... Okay, when you got married, and you got kids... Well, first of all, let's backtrack to when you got married. When you got married... You made a decision to start your own family. Yes, you are part of his family. Yes, he is part of your family. You guys have, have connected those families together through marriage. But you created your own family. You created your own rules. You created your own uh, um, you know, traditions. You created everything. You are your own family. You do your own thing. That is what you do. Plain and simple. You guys do what you want to do. Now, this will be hard because it's going to require your husband to, lack of a better word, grow a spine. Okay? Because if you put up the wall for the in-laws and tell them, hey, we got to make our own decisions, then if he's not in with it, if, he, if, he, if he's not there with you in with the same idea of what's going on, it's not going to work. You're going to look like the bad guy. You guys have to be on the same page. Now, I will say it this way. The greatest thing that my wife and I have ever done that has helped our marriage the most was move away. Okay. This is probably not an option for you guys right now. But it did help us. Now, you do need to put, set some boundaries. And how do you do that? Just tell them. Be, you're an adult. <laughs> Plain and simple. You're an adult. M set the boundary. Make the boundaries there. Your in-laws, they'll either fall in place or they won't. And if they don't, then you just tell them, this is, the, this is the wall. This is the boundary. This is where we are. This is how this is going to be. That's how that works. If they can't respect that, then they don't respect you. And you should say it that way. You should tell them, listen, we need some space. You're still part of the family. We love you. But I need some peace. I kind of feel like that you guys are involved too much. Sometimes it will take a conversation that is going to be a hard conversation to have. And that's what you got to do. Sadly, that's the things that needs to be done. You got to have a conversation. Just do the conversation. That can be sucky. It can be really hard. But if you do it, it'll be worth it. Anyway. All right. What else we got? Hey, Devin. I hope everything's doing well. My name is Natalie, and I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm, eagerly, I'm eager to teach my children about financial responsibility, especially with the holiday season approaching. When spending tends to be incre tends to increase, however, I'm struggling to find ways to make to manage to make money management engaging for them. They see money as an abstract concept and often demand things without understanding their value. How do I instill the importance of budgeting and saving in a way to resonate with them? What challenge, What changes should I anticipate and how can I address them effectively? Money is tough, especially in a world where we continue to have less money than we anything else. So here's how we do this. If you want to teach your kids about money and you want to teach them to be responsible about money and to understand its value, then you need to create something of value for them. Now, I say this jokingly, okay? Every year, my kids go out and go trick-or-treat. At least they used to. This year, we're down to one kid trick-or-treating, and he's almost to the point where he's like, he's not going to trick-or-treat anymore, okay? Now, that being said, every year, my kids know that when they go out and they knock doors and they collect candy, 
they do have to pay the piper. Right? So if my kid, like this year, my our youngest, he brought home 17 pounds of candy. Yes, you heard me. He brought home 17 pounds of candy. How is that even possible? Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know how that's possible. I just know he did it. I know that uh, <laughs> the, the, the reality is 17 pounds of candy is a crap ton of candy. It's more candy than any kid should ever have, but they, he did it anyway. But guess what happens? Every year he comes home, he brings candy. We do the parent tax. Yes, we take some of the candy. Now, obviously, this year we didn't take as much. But over the years, he's realized that this is what, how this works. So, so it goes. To, it applies to money, too. Now, the second thing that you can do, other than the, the, the kit, the dad tax and the mom tax when it comes to candy, what you can do is simple. One, you go in and you teach your kids to work. Plain and simple. You teach your kids to work. You teach them to do the right thing. You teach them that but for every, I mean, honestly, an hourly job, teach them to work. Have them do things for other people to make money that will help them in, in the right way. Right? That simple. I, I see you, Bentley. Bentley crawled down. He's right here. The, re the reality is, if you want to teach your kids the, the you know the value of a dollar, have them do work for somebody else. Even if you know, so our youngest he wanted to make some money, so he'd always ask us what can he do. Two, he we'd tell him go go talk to people. He started going knocking doors and asking people if he can take out their trash for them, and if and by taking out the trash, he would ask them to, if they, to pay him if they if he could, they could pay him to take out the trash. Have them find creative ways to make money. If you do this, your kids will learn the value of a dollar. And then they'll learn if they blow it, it's gone and they won't have another one, but they can they can make more money. See, that that's the whole thing. You Your kids can learn that they can make more money. and But the hard part is learn teaching to save the money. That's when this comes into play. When they have them start spending their own money for the things they want versus you buying it for all four of them, then they'll appreciate the dollar a little bit more. Then they'll want to start saving it more so they can get the things that they really want. If they want a big computer, a gaming computer, make them save for it. Make them work for it and save for it. Tell them that you'll pay for half if you want to do that, but they have to earn the other half. Plain and simple. All right, what else we got? Hey, Devin. I've been feeling increasingly disconnected from with from my spouse. We've been married for over five years, and I love them deeply. It seems like we're speaking different languages when it comes to our needs and feelings. I've tried to initi initiate conversations, but they often end in frustration or misunderstanding. I'm worried that if we don't address th this soon, it could lead to resentment how can we approach our communication and rebuild that emotional connection? Okay. There's a lot to unpack on this one. You're feeling disconnected with your spouse. Okay, let's let's we gotta address that one. Okay. First address the disconnection. You guys have been married for five years, and you say you love each other deeply. But you, when you, it seems like you're, you're, you're speaking two different languages. Okay, here's the thing. Both men and women do speak different languages, right? You have to learn the love language of, the, of your spouse. Okay, you have to. If you don't, you're setting yourself up for mass failure. And that's where you feel like you're going is mass failure. Over the past five years, what has transpired that has, that has brought you to this point, right? That's the first major question I would have. What's gone on in the past five years that, that you guys feel disconnected from each other? Okay. I don't want to say that there's some infidelity there. I hope that there is not. If it's a lot of work. If so, thing is, if you're working a full-time job and he's working a full-time job, 
And then say you guys are missing each other. Like one's working a third shift, one's working a first shift. So you're kind of missing each other in passing. That could cause a lot of stress on a marriage. If you have kids that are that in, in, in your life, that can cause a stress on your marriage as well. So to solve the problem, you've got to learn how to communicate, which yes, you're asking me how do we solve the communication issue? You got to just talk to each other. You got to spend time with each other. Are you going on date nights regularly? Seriously. Or are you just coming home and turning on TV and watching eating dinner in front of the television? I'll tell you, if you're if you're coming home every day and you're eating dinner in front of the television or you're sitting at the table and you're play, scrolling on your phone instead of commu- talking to each other, that's the problem right there. You should have a very straightforward discussion and say, hey, let's do no con- no digital content or anything at the table. If you don't have a table, get a table. Don't eat in front of the TV. Don't be sucked into all the screens that you have out there. Do something that gets you away from the screen that puts you in an environment that you are honestly forced to talk to each other. You need to talk to each other. You should be talking to each other. Go on date nights. Spend time with each other. Do those things. Don't nag them. Say, hey, I would like to go out this weekend. What would you like to do? Ask him, and he says, I don't care, whatever you want to do. Then say, okay, well, I'm going to plan something. I want you to make sure you are available. So you tell him. Plain and simple. Tell him you want to him to be available. You're going to plan it out and go do it. Then you do it. Do the thing. Spend time with each other. If he doesn't like, so you go out and he doesn't feel like he's doing the, the having fun, say, hey, why don't, could you do this since I planned this one? Why don't you plan one for next week? Whatever you want to do, I would love to go with you. I would love to be there. I would love to do all that. Do the, do that. That's what you got to do. If you spend time with each other and you make it quality time, it'll be good. Quality time screams everything. If you just spend that time and do what it takes to make him feel good, he'll open back up to you. Men are simple. If we feel respected and we feel that someone cares about us, we will be okay. And we will. We'll we'll, we'll react in kind. That simple. Hey, Devin. With winter approaching, I want to create memorable experiences for for my family before the cold sets in. However, I find I'm finding it challenging to engage my family in activities that are both fun and meaningful. I fear that if we don't find the right balance, we'll end up spending too much time on screens instead and creating last uh, last uh, instead of creating lasting memories. What creative projects or activities do you suggest that can strengthen our family bond while allowing everyone to express their individuality? I love your ideas. Thanks, Sophie from Salt Lake City. Okay, Sophie, you live in Salt Lake. You're my neighbor. Here's what you need to do. There are tons of things to do, especially in the wintertime. And if you live here, that means you already have winter clothing, most likely. There's a ton of things to do in Salt Lake in the wintertime. One, there's ice skating. Two, there's games like uh, going to hockey games or whatever. There, there's tons of games to do. There's tons of things to do. There's a lot to do. I, for one, like the hiking. There's uh, hot springs. Hot springs are awesome. And you're not if you if you got to hike to some of these hot springs. Fifth Water Hot Spring is actually one of my favorites. Um, Shannon and I, we've done a couple of different hot springs here in Utah and fifth water is currently my favorite one. I know there's some, some other ones that we haven't done, but we're going to be, we're going to get to them at least before the, before our last year here in Utah's up, we're going to, 
Um, so with the, with the, there's that. There's also Little Sahara, which honestly the best time to go to that is actually right now because it's not too cold yet, but and it's not too hot down there. So you actually get on the, the sand dunes and do things like that. Get outside. That's what you got to do. Get your family excited about going outside and do more. Buy board games. When it gets when the snow starts hitting in, you can go snow. You can go sledding. You can go you know tubing down the hills. Utah has a ton. The, every park has a big hill, and they do that on for on purpose because in the wintertime, it gets covered with snow and people like to slide down it. Plain and simple. That is one thing I did not realize until we moved here. But Utah does the winter very well. They know how to handle it and they know how to make things good. So you're here in Utah. I'm telling you. If you want to spend time with each other, do those things. Uh, sorry, my allergies. Bentley's literally underneath me. <laughs> I am allergic to my dog. He's actually my wife's dog, but I love him to death anyway, and that's what that is. So, man, sorry about that. Ugh. Getting itchy eyes and itchy uh, ears. Thank you, Bentley. All right. Anyway, you know, all right, I got one more. And this one is from James in Nashville, Tennessee. James, thank you for e- emailing me. I'm going to tell you I miss Nashville. One day I'll be back there and we can maybe talk to each other. we we'll see what happens. Anyway, hey, Devin. I recently f- uh, faced a significant setback in my career. I was passed over for a promotion I had worked hard for and and it's left me feeling defeated and unsure of my next steps. I worry that this failure reflects poorly on my abilities and could hinder my future opportunities. How can I turn this experience into a valuable learning opportunity and rebuild my confidence? What mindset shifts should I consider to move forward positively in a positive manner. Okay, you know, being passed up by a a a, a, a um for a da, 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 promotion is one thing I do understand. Okay, it's sucky. It's not fun. And don't, I'm going to tell you this, and you're not you're going to believe me, but you need to do it. Don't worry about it. Seriously, don't dwell on the fact that they passed you up. They don't know what they're missing. Okay, first and foremost, they know they they made a decision based off of whatever they did. They made a decision that that will, you know, may be good for them or it may be bad. I don't know. I can't answer that question because I'm not them. But I will tell you, if you continue to work hard, you'll get other opportunities. Now, I'm not saying that you'll get opportunities with the company that you're with, but I will tell you, if you keep honing your skills, you keep learning the things that you're learning, keep working your hardest, it will be recognized, okay? Also, be open to the point that you could find a new job, okay? That's okay. It is okay to find a new job. It is okay to to move from a company that to where you were passed up to another company, now, I'm not telling you to just do that right now. I'm telling you to pay attention to the signs of things that could be better for you in the future. Okay? Use your current company to the point that it can help you develop better skills. Hone the ones you have and make those even greater. Learn from the new person that got the promotion. Seriously, they got something to teach you. Be willing, be teachable. Honestly, the best managers out there are ones that are willing to listen to what other people say, to take it into stride, and and then make a decision off of that. So if you can learn to be teachable for someone who probably didn't deserve the promotion, but you and because you did, if you can learn from that, you'll be a better a manager or leader in in the, your current business or in the business to come. Don't dwell on the fact that you that they overlooked you. Think of, take it as an opportunity to better yourself more, to be a better person for your business and for that business. That's it's, it's that simple. This is an opportunity to grow. 
it's an opportunity to make yourself that much better. They passed you up. Don't worry about it. That could, that honestly, I'll say it, that could be totally their loss. So don't stress over it. Be happy. Honestly, sometimes we don't think about it. Being passed up for things like this tend to be the best blessings you can ever get. I promise you. It may not seem like it, but it, it can be. So don't stress over it. It'll be okay. Not what you wanted to hear, I'm sure. But it's what you got. So, anyway. I just want to say thank you for everybody that, that, that has uh, sent me emails so far this year. It's been amazing. I appreciate it. I love you guys. I love everything you've done. I keep sending them our way. We got Christmas coming up. We got other things coming up. I've got a great project coming up that I wanted to get you guys involved in. Um, so feel free to reach out, ask me questions. I actually will drop the information on that on that uh, that about that project here very soon. Be prepared for it. Would love your help to help promote it and get it out there more. Anyway, hope you guys do have a fantastic evening, and I will talk to you guys later. We'll see ya. Get a priority when life falls apart. Raw and true, no hesitation. Covering life without the reservation. Family roots and wayward souls. Stories deep like black and cold. Guiding you when times are tough. Stick around if you ain't had enough. A young Thank you.